Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kubernetes on Edge Day. Um, the next talk is ours. Obviously, that's why we are here. Uh, Kubernetes Hunger Games Distro Performance in the Edge. My name is Sayam Bhattak, and I am a field CTO at Sivo, reimagining the broken cloud. And I am joined by. at Millisearch. So it's a bit excited to be presenting today. Yeah. All right. So of course, we know that we are at the Edge conference. And then when we talk about standard communities, while it is great to also work on the Edge, in a lot of times when you're working in resource-constrained environments, your standard Kubernetes distribution can be very uh, complex to set up and also might not work well for edge environments where you are often constrained by the resource and the bandwidth often. So that is why we have a look at the different types of Kubernetes distributions. So what exactly are Kubernetes distributions? So these are essentially just distributions for your standard Kubernetes packaged together by different companies. These could be enterprise or even open source, and they do serve different purposes as we'll kind of explore in more. Now, of course, uh, the major differences that we look at are managed as well as open source. So when it comes to open source distributions, these are often led by communities, and uh, these are free to use with open source licenses that anyone can leverage. So these are great if your team is wanting to self-host these distributions and self-manage them. But of course, that comes with a caveat that often the team will be responsible for upgrading the version of Kubernetes in these distributions and will be responsible for setting up all the different things like networking uh, that will be uh, supported by these distributions. Whereas with managed Kubernetes uh, distributions, these are often designed for more larger enterprises because, uh, of course, these distributions are managed by the providers like GKE or AWS AKS uh, clusters, and the responsibility of like managing and upgrading the Kubernetes versions, all of those are taken care by these companies that are running these managed Kubernetes distributions. Uh, but of course, that comes with the caveat that these can be sometimes uh, be slow in order to upgrade them because that will depend on the company which is uh, running these distributed uh, community uh, platforms. But today's session is going to be more focused on leveraging open source community distributions. Uh, we'll be taking a look at K3S, K0S, and MicroKates as an example to kind of showcase how you can leverage these uh, distributions for edge workloads. But of course, uh, one of the questions that everyone might, everyone might ask is that why do we need so many distributions? So the simple answer is that there are a number of different use cases for which you might leverage uh, all of these different uh, distributions, right? Some of them might be focused on running on edge devices. So that's what we're going to be exploring today with the likes of MicroKates, K3S, and K0S. And all of them serve different purposes. Of course, at, this, at the core, they are all running Kubernetes, but they will have support for different CNIs or different storage mechanism. And depending on your use case, you might end up using one of them. Of course, you'll also have the capability to choose between open source and managed Kubernetes distributions. So let's start by first taking a look at K3S. Uh, so K3S is an open source um, Kubernetes distribution created by Swiss Labs, and it serves as a single binary. Now, if you take a look at the architecture of uh, K3S, you are primarily having the server node and your agent nodes. And both of them kind of work on providing different capabilities. So out of the box, it does come with all of the core components that you will expect in any Kubernetes distribution. Now, with, when it comes to uh, the server node, that's mainly taking care of your uh, of your Kubernetes API controller and all of the scheduler, whereas the agent will take care of your um, things like your kube proxy and, of course, uh, all of the container uh, CNI related things. Of course, like with um, the controller with a K3, we are using Flannel as our uh, default CNI and then container D as our default container runtime. So that's the first. And of course, like K3S is really small. So perhaps in comparison that we're running today, it has the smallest binary sizes compared to even K0S and MicroKates. And uh, that makes it really great for edge workloads. 
The next one is MicroKeats. Uh, this is run by Canonical and served as, so as compared to K3S and K0S, it's not a single binary. In fact, like you have to install it via Snap. Um, and again, but the great thing about MicroKeats is that it's actually the fastest single node cluster that you can run uh, in comparison to any other uh, distribution that is out there. And then finally, we are going to be talking about, about K0S. So it's, I think like, it's one of the, the most newest uh, community distributions that is out there. Similar to K3S, it also serves as a single binary that you can install. And it is about three to four times larger in terms of binary sizes compared to uh, K0, uh, K3S, but it does come with more security add-ons or security benefits as compared to the other Kubernetes distributions that we have covered today, uh, because it's fully compliant with uh, the, uh, and we'll kind of also explore why is it better. So we'll be exploring those in the latest slides, but it also does come with standard distributions like support for role, uh, role, uh, RBAC and then OpenID and support for being able to actually connect GPUs with NVIDIA, uh, graphics as well. So that's a quick overlook on these three different types of uh, distributions that we're going to be taking a look. And this is a kind of a feature comparison between the different Kubernetes uh, distributions. Uh, of course, you can take a look at for your reference, uh, especially because of the CPU uh, architecture, right? Because when we're comparing different types of Kubernetes distributions for edge workloads, you end up working with a diverse set of device architectures. So choosing the right kind of Kubernetes distribution for your edge workload, depending on the type of device architecture you're working with, is really important. And uh, here are some other comparisons, uh, primarily with respect to the minimum CPU RAM. Uh, again, this information will be useful depending on what kind of uh, use case you, you're going to be running. Now, with the next section, uh, Sam will kind of walk you through our test, uh, test benchmark uh, around our setup that we used to test the performance and what all different things we compared uh, for our test setup. So over to you, Sam. Uh, okay, so by now you should have an understanding, or at least a brief understanding of what K0S is, K3S is, and MicroKates, all other Kubernetes distributions, certified CNCF, out of which K3S is a CNCF sandbox project, the only distribution to be a sandbox project. So in the benchmarks that we are running, disclaimer is that this is running on a single node, which is uh, one CPU, two gigs of RAM, 20 gigs of storage, um, lesser than Raspberry Pi 4 specs. Um, running Ubuntu 20.04, each of them has the base install, like there are different servers, obviously, different nodes with the same specs, but each of them has very minimal single node uh, Kubernetes deployment for MicroKates, K0S, and K3S, all three of them. And uh, we have choose the uh, benchmark operator. So if you see there is a benchmark operator, I'll put the repo uh, as well. Um, so we have run a few tests. The first one is the iperf test. So in this, if you see the YAML file, this particular YAML file, so first is the operator deployment. So there is a benchmark operator that is getting deployed. And then there are series of tests that can be run against the Kubernetes clusters. So one of the first tests that is run is the iperf testing, where it actually creates a client and a server, sends the request, um, and it's basically to measure the network throughput. And this is how the logs will come out. So it creates a job, um, it gives you the logs, and it gives you certain values. Um, one of the things that it gives is the average bit rate, like you can calculate the average bit rate that refers to the average amount of data transmitted over the network in the given period, and then the stability of the uh, network, because that's pretty important. Um, this is how the performance benchmark looks like. So the green with the dot is K3S, the plain line without anything is MicroKates, and the green with the arrowheads is the K0S. So that's how the benchmarks looks like. What it depicts is uh, the outcome. Um, the, it's there on the right-hand side, still the same. Um, so average bit rate for K3S is one gigs uh, per second then the variability is highly high availability high variability with the spikes up to 2.4 2.74 uh, coming to micro kates it comes down to 559 and then for k0s it's say, similar to what uh, micro kates is um, the next 
is the sysbench. So again, the same operator, we are using a different custom resource. So for this particular thing, it's basically a sysbench where we are measuring CPU and file IO. Uh, CPU is measure how quickly the system can compute prime numbers in this particular case, which is the direct indicator of CPU performance. On the file IO side, it's using the MTDIR because we haven't specified any volume over here, volume the storage class. Uh, so it measures the performance of the system's disk by executing random read-write operations. I mean, that's how usually the um, file IO performance would be calculated, but we'll also do a specific, we have also done a specific FIO test uh, using a specific um, storage class, with, which is same across all the clusters. But for this one, this is the sysbench one. So here you have, again, uh, when it gets completed, you get uh, CPU speeds, you get general stats, you get the latency, and um, all these, it depicts the events per second. So in this particular case, you have the 5, 535 events per second, latency per request 1.79, uh, that is mentioned over there in the average, and then general stats is the total time CPU test was approximately uh, 10 seconds. Now, again, in the same logs, this is for file IO, that was because we did two. Uh, so it created 128 files of this much size um, that was used, and the file operation, you can see the reads, 92.77 per second, the writes, 61.84 per second, and the sinks, then the throughputs, and then the latency. So, and also the total time. So you also get to see the uh, total time for the number of uh, events that were there. Uh, this is how the results look like. Sorry, this is how the results look like. So you can see the CPU performance. Uh, this is the K3S one. This is the K0S one and the micro K8S one. Um, so K3S one is faster in the CPU one, but for the files, you can see K0S Overall, the file read-write operation, K0S, is exceeding K3S. Yeah, so K3S demonstrates the best CPU performance uh, with the high speed, high write speed, indicating uh, robust processing and data handling. K0S offers best overall file I/O operation in terms of reads, writes, syncs uh, per second. Micro, micro K8s is a bit on the lower side, so whenever you are choosing a distribution, this if this read-write operation matters to you, uh, or the CPU cycles matter to you, then probably this benchmark would help in that. Uh, the next benchmark is obviously the stress, because it's important to put stress on the clusters. So uh, this particular thing is putting a stress on a cluster with CPU memory and virtual memory, uh, running in parallel for 30 seconds, and using one single instance, because we have it, and we have also defined uh, the limits um, request uh, the, the limits as well so that it doesn't cross the particular limits because we only had two CPUs for this particular node. So we don't want to cross that so that it crashes. Um, and this is how the results look like for the stress uh, performance comparison um, in terms of, so you can see the K3S is the, the light green one with the big one, and then is the K0S and the small one becomes the uh, micro K8s. And CPU performance, uh, so K0, K3S demonstrates the highest CPU performance with uh, 528, um, and K0S 363, followed by that is micro K8s with 231. And then coming to the virtual memory performance, K3S again leads significantly. Um, you can see the numbers, then K0S, and then again on the lower side is micro K8s. And then the last section is of the memory copy. Again, K3S outperforms the others with uh, 90. Then you have 60, still fairly comparable of K0S and micro K's, but K3S is uh, a bit on the higher side. So K3S performs better across the cluster, suggesting it may be best for the resource intensive apps. K0S is moderate, um, so usual general apps. And this particular stress test that we did on the current setup with disclaimer that I mentioned, micro K8 is with the lowest performance. Uh, the next one is not using the same operator. So this is a, this is a new tool that is being installed on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so first thing that has been done is installation. So you have three clusters. Uh, the next thing that is being done is adding the local path provisioner as the storage class. 
Now with K3S, if you have seen the, one of the first slides where Shivai was showing the feature comparison, so it had, it, K3S already comes with a local path provisioner. Uh, on the other, since we want to keep, we, we wanted to keep everything same, so we added local path provisioner as a storage class for micro -Kates and local path provisioner as the storage class for K0S. After that, uh, we had KBench. So KBench is a small repository under Longhorn, um, under the Longhorn, which is again a big uh, project for the storage. Uh, and it defines, it, it calculates three things, IOPS, uh, bandwidth, and latency, uh, like how many individual read-write operations, um, basically higher would be the better number here, then the bandwidth, total amount of data uh, that can be read-write to from the storage system. Again, this one is higher, the better. Last one is latency, delay before the transfer begins. This one is lower, the better. So like this, uh, we have done the benchmark on all the three again. And again, the logs, this is how when it finishes, you get the logs from the benchmark uh, summary. Um, you have the IOP. It also do random read write and then sequential read write. So you have random measures uh, and then you have sequential, same for the bandwidth, same for the latency. This is how your benchmarks look like for the IOPS part. So in this particular thing, um, IOPS read K0S is greater than K3S, then microcades. In the IOPS write, microcades is greater than the K0S and then the K3S. Coming to our results for um, the bandwidth, uh, microcades read bandwidth is for microcades is better than K3S. Um, Okay, I don't know why I put two, but yeah, it's better than K3S and then K0S. Um, and then bandwidth for write, uh, K3S is greater than the micro -Kates and then K0S. Uh, the last one is the latency. Uh, so remember the latency, lower is better. So uh, although K3S is greater than K0S than micro -Kates, but micro -Kates win over here because in latency lower is uh, be better. And both for read and write. Uh, now, another thing uh, that, that I just did randomly was the free hyphen M command after installing all the three. Interestingly, micro K8 has the lowest uh, footprint in terms of the memory consumption just as a plain cluster. Like just if you install micro K8 on a same spec uh, VM and then you install K0S and K3S. So slightly lower uh, micro -Kates and then K0S and K3S is on the higher side. Uh, now this is all good. Um, these are still bigger devices, like Raspberry Pi 4s are coming up with, you know, eight gigs of RAM. These are not now smaller devices. Even the NUCs, you still can have big clusters um, on these devices. Even you actually can do a simple cube ADM kind of cluster on these devices. But what about the industrial IoT devices? Industrial IoT devices are even much smaller. They don't have uh, gigabytes of RAM, so they cannot afford even the 500 um, RAM consumption that I showed in the in the pre one of the previous slides. So there is one uh, new thing uh, which is out there. I thought I would mention it in this particular session as well, which is K2D. Um, it is not a distro, uh, so it is not a distribution. It is just a, you can call it a translator uh, for the Kubernetes APIs to the Docker commands. So it's no operator. There are no Kubernetes components. Um, for example, there is no operator support, no RBAC support, no service account support. Um, it is, it's just a Docker with the Kubernetes API translator. So what it can do is, um, it, it just takes 20 megabytes of um, overhead for a particular node and it, it actually behaves as a node. So you can either use direct Docker commands on that particular node or you can communicate with the API translator provided by K2D to translate your specs from the pod to the workloads that gets deployed as containers on this particular node where you have K2D. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's not a distro, it's not something, everything that you can do on a Kubernetes cluster, you will be able to do it, but it still serves a kind of purpose on very small devices, um, and it gives you the feel of Kubernetes. Another thing I wanted to mention over here is Talos. Um, 
people do count it in the Kubernetes distributions, but uh, it's basically a Kubernetes native operating system. So, uh, for example, people have been deploying, you know, their highly available Kubernetes clusters on the operating systems which are way older and not meant for Kubernetes because Kubernetes was not invented by that time. Uh, so Andrew, one of my friends at Sidero Labs, um, around 2015-16 time frame, he decided to kind of write an operating system natively just to run Kubernetes from scratch. So this is actually an OS written from scratch, highly secure, widely used in production. Uh, it has no SSH, the same design principles of uh, you write a custom resource file, uh, the YAML file spec, and that can be translated towards whatever you want to do and how you want to spin up your Kubernetes cluster. So all API-driven, image-based, no SSH, uh, every user is RBAC-based, and atomic upgrades in place. So if it's upgraded, it's done. Uh, not like some of the binaries are upgraded, it fails in the middle and upgrades are an issue. Uh, some of the features, declarative YAML file, you can choose your CNI, apply YAML. Um, most, like 90% of the directories are read-only directories. There are specific directories for specific use cases. For example, your uh, storage class and stuff where you have uh, read-only access to certain dry, uh, drives. And also, you have extensions. For example, you need a different container runtime altogether like Gvisor or you want to run WebAssembly workloads. Um, so you can have an extension for that. I created a Wasm Edge extension. Um, so that can be done at, via the extensions. But and as an OS, it's, you can not do much. These are the set of 12, I think 12 binaries, uh, one of the latest blogs from them. Uh, 12 binaries just needed to run Kubernetes because you don't want all the stuff in the operating system which is there to run Kubernetes. Coming to the final piece, uh, Cube Edge, uh, you want to take? So of course, today we kind of covered what are the different type of distributions and comparing the performance. But of course, we also have Kubeds as a project, which not necessarily a distribution, but it comes integrated with Kubernetes uh, to help you to adopt a lot of the functionalities uh, that you'll get uh, inside of a native implementation for running it on uh, edge workloads. So I'll re definitely recommend you to also take a look. A lot of times you might want to see like running a more Kubernetes uh, or edge friendly distribution versus also running Kubeds. Um, but of course, uh, just one final slide around um, when to use what. So this is just a speaker opinion that we wanted to share today. In terms of like simplicity of usage, uh, we recommend micro kits just because the ability to very easily like do upgrades and also like it gets additional support for GPUs and all. Uh, then binary size, as we mentioned, like K3s is probably one of the smallest ones out there because of its smallest binary size. Uh, in terms of dashboards, you get built-in dashboards for micro K8s and K0s, but not for K3s. So if uh, you're all, and for example, for default storage, uh, K3s comes with default storage, but it's not supported directly for uh, K0s and micro K8s. Uh, and I think in terms of security, so I think uh, K0S does uh, really win over here because, of course, it comes with 100% FIPS compliance as well. And finally, uh, machine learning, because we know like today for edge computing, machine learning is very huge. While uh, all di different kind of Kubernetes distributions uh, can work well, you might want to consider the ones that have native support for GPU. So for example, uh, K0S, K3S, and Micro8s all might have some sort of su uh, support for um, for GPUs, but of course, with, when it comes to like micro kits, it has inbuilt support for NVIDIA drivers, uh, for you know uh, dynamic resource allocation, but also uh, it has really nice support for its armed Kubeflow. So if you're running machine learning orchestration, then both K3 Yes, with its serverless machine learning workloads capability, and with uh, for you know, like for running Kubeflow, uh, as well as with micro kits with the special version of Kubeflow that's Storm Kubeflow that's usually a bit smaller as compared to your regular in a Kubeflow that you might ship. Uh, that might be a great workflow for you to run. So if you're if any of your companies is running machine learning workloads, then that's a great way to kind of compare between these three and then use. But finally, uh, uh, thanks for uh, you know. Yeah, just, our presentation. just one thing I want to add, quickly add over the security aspect. Um, like Talos is the by far best in terms of Kubernetes distribution, like not the distribution, like you can call it distribution and a native OS, but yeah, Talos Kubernetes clusters would be best 
for the securities. Case US has very interesting thing, which is control plane isolation. So it gives you a banished Kubernetes field where you just do kubectl, you'll get nodes and you do not get the control plane visible over there. So you can have only the uh, visible nodes would be where you actually run your workload. So it gives you the feel of uh, managed distros where you usually do not see the control plane uh, nodes. Um, also, yeah, do share your feedback uh, for this particular session. Um, and I, I, so today we, we covered the Kubernetes distributions, microcades, K0s, K3s, the theory part, what are they, why distribution exists, uh, then some of the managed Kubernetes distros as well. And then we ran uh, the benchmarks, which are the benchmark operator by Cloud Bulldozer, I think. Um, benchmark. Yes, Cloud Bulldozer, uh, they have this particular um, repository called Benchmark Operator. It has wide variety of benchmarks that you can do um, for all the things. So we did Stress and we did iPerf. Uh, we also did uh, one of the K-Bench for FIO testing, uh, all the fancy graphs, and then um, some of the conclusions. So yeah, hope, hope this helps. And yeah, I can also show you how they were done. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I'm not doing any demo actually. So you can just see um, all the Kubernetes version uh, were on 1.28. So it's very difficult to move the mouse around like this. So for example, here as well, you can see Kubernetes 1.28.7. So this one is the K0s, this is K3s, and uh, this one is the micro K. It's all the same clusters, uh, similar VMs and the benchmarks that have been done. Uh, results can vary across different environments and stuff. Would be happy to chat if you are willing to provide some of your inputs on where we can test these, how we can you know, uh, benchmark in a different way as well. Thank you so much and thanks for coming to our talk. Thank you.